Bienvenidas, bienvenidos a esta primera edición de Masterclass Chi Network 360. Estamos muy contentos de tenerlas y tenerlos a todas y a todos eh, en esta primera edición, en esta iniciativa que hoy vamos a compartir con todas y todos. Eh, como ustedes saben, represento a la Cámara de Comercio LGBT Argentina y desde hace 13 años organizamos cada año un evento en la Ciudad de Buenos Aires al que asisten más de 15, 20 países todos los años, cuyos ejes principales son el turismo LGBT, las comunicaciones, la inclusión de las personas de nuestro colectivo y... En este tiempo de pandemia que estamos transitando y comenzando a salir y comenzando a ver un poco el final, hemos decidido ir un paso más allá e incorporar esta nueva iniciativa que se llama Masterclass G Network 360. La idea es seguir capacitando, seguir formándonos y trabajando para ese día después. Masterclass no es ni más ni menos que los cuatro pilares principales que conforman G-Network 360 cada año aquí en Buenos Aires. Y de la mano de las mejores, de los mejores, de les mejores, de cada país del mundo con los que trabajamos desde hace muchos años. Hoy les pido que nos acompañen a compartir cada una de estas clases magistrales imperdibles. Eh, de verdad vamos a aprender un montón. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos y a disfrutar una jornada increíble. Muchas gracias. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Desde el Instituto Nacional de Promoción Turística de la República Argentina queremos invitarlos a participar este año del Masterclass 2021 que organiza la Cámara de Comercio LGBT de nuestro país. Como ustedes todos saben, la pandemia ha imposibilitado la realización anual del tradicional JIT Network que se producía aquí en la República Argentina. En ese contexto, este Masterclass 2021 nos dará la posibilidad y les dará la posibilidad de conocer, la, aprender y escuchar de los principales expertos en el mundo de turismo LGBT. Este Masterclass va a estar este, dividido en cuatro ejes temáticos. El primero será diversidad e inclusión. Otro tema a tratar será la tendencia en los medios digitales. También se hablará sobre el futuro del turismo, la innovación, los startups y también habrá un capítulo especial para las historias que inspiran. Es bueno que nos encontremos, es bueno que continuemos trabajando juntos para estar preparados en el momento que la situación sanitaria lo permita, las fronteras se reabran y comienza esta reactivación paulatina del turismo en todo el mundo. Los invitamos a compartir este Masterclass 2021. Bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Juan Insunza, gerente comercial para Delta Airlines en Argentina y estamos muy contentos de estar aquí con eh, G-Network apoyando Masterclass, eh, aprovechando eh, salir de este contexto actual, esta pandemia que ha paralizado el mundo entero, eh, siempre contentos de seguir apoyando y estar en, en un partnership con eh, G-Network. En Delta estamos comprometidos con la diversidad, 
con la igualdad, con la inclusión a todos los niveles. Y estos tiempos de, de COVID-19 nos han hecho reflexionar de una manera y darnos cuenta que eh, en muchos aspectos estamos fallando y queremos enmendar eso, queremos arreglar eso. Estamos usando el poder de nuestra marca para hacer conciencia global. Eh, dentro de la compañía tenemos 10 grupos eh, de diversidad y bueno, contarles que Delta fue reconocida por la revista Fortune ya tres años seguidos como el mejor lugar para trabajar en diversidad, el mejor lugar para trabajar para las mujeres y para los veteranos. Estamos muy contentos de seguir en este partnership con G Network y nos vemos pronto. One stereotype or I guess um, common misconception with Polynesians is that we all must play a sport. It kind of just defines us and encloses us as one thing or one person. Like when, sometimes when I walk in the room and then everybody turns around and looks at me. Um, and I think it's just because of the things that people see on the media and things like that about just stereotypes of people that look like me and dress like me. In the Latin community, being gay is not that it's not acceptable, but the way that people approach it is a little bit different than, for example, here in the United States. I ended up living two different lives. I began to learn English when I was 24, I think. Because of your accent, they tend to uh, perceive you as someone who can contribute less, which often is not true. As I grew up, I grew up in a world that was not built for me. There generally has been uh, an element of having to prove myself. I've always had tattoos, and for many years it was very much uh, a taboo thing because the perception was that you're a bad person if you had tattoos. So I take my pride in proving them wrong, letting them know, you know, I am a very good person, I'm a good father, I'm a responsible worker. A waitress came over and said that we couldn't hold hands in the restaurant. I was really just kind of heartbroken that somebody would feel that way just because I'm holding hands with with a woman. Over time, it just you start to realize that you had to treat yourself the right way. It started to feel like it was about the time that I could safely come out and not have to worry about all the uh, hate that seems to typically be lobbed at transgender people. The assumptions people put on you, it doesn't bother me now, but I remember when I was in college and I had told a gentleman that I was in the aviation flight science program and he basically laughed in my face when I told him, you know, my career choice. I hope that as time goes on, I don't want to be a rare sighting. My favorite thing about Delta actually is I was just always me. Like, I, everybody treated me like I'm used to it and nothing else. Working at Delta, they, it's afforded me the ability to experience lots of different cultures. I feel like I'm a better person because I've experienced more things. I am living my best life. I, I can't imagine uh, being at other places where I can't be who I am. And Delta makes it so easy for me. We're not the same. It is okay. Delta is giving you the opportunity of being who you are and using those qualities to engage with passengers in the United States and if not in the world. I like Delta's approach to just treating us all like regular people. Hola a todos, sí, este es el segundo bloque de G Network 360 versión Masterclass. Aquí estamos en vivo por streaming desde Buenos Aires, preparadísimos todos, creo que ustedes también, así lo siento, para disfrutar de una masterclass que está arraigadísima a mi criterio en muchas de las necesidades del presente. Este evento organizado por la Cámara de Comercio LGBT de la Argentina y por el Instituto Nacional de Promoción Turística cuenta además 
con el apoyo de estas empresas, de estas organizaciones que lo hacen posible gracias Visit Argentina, Delta Airlines, IBM Argentina, Hertz Argentina, Grupo GEA, gracias a cada una de las empresas que hacen posible Masterclass. Ahora sí, quiero presentarle formalmente lo que continúa, lo que sigue. Quiero presentarles a Tristan Norman, que es Head of Creative Insight and Getty Images de Nueva York. Es una reconocidísima, gran profesional, que hoy va a presentar una clase magistral en serio. La era de la inclusión, se llama, ideas clave sobre la importancia de la autenticidad en las narrativas visuales. Este no es cualquier momento en la historia y no es cualquier momento en la historia de las imágenes. Un montón de marcas se preguntan cómo dialogar con imágenes con el presente, cómo atrapar desde las imágenes nuevos clientes o, en todo caso, clientes, personas que se sienten afuera de esas iconografías, afuera de esas escenas. El desafío es monumental. Lo que cuentan las imágenes siempre fue demasiado poderoso como para no tenerlo en cuenta en semejante panorama de cambios. Por eso, sin más prólogo, directamente quiero saludarla. Hello, Tristan, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me and for that warm introduction. I appreciate it. We are very happy to, to have you, and well, it's all, uh, I, I mean, you can start right now. Uh, we are very happy to, to have you, and we want to hear you right now. <laughs> well, I want to share with you, so thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Tristan Norman, and I am the head of Creative Insights for the Americas, and I am beyond thrilled to be with you today. Um, what I want to talk to you about is really how visuals are evolving in this age of inclusion. You know, we're in the midst of a massive sociocultural shift. We have a global pandemic happening. We had so much social unrest mid last year. And consumers are demanding that brands stand for more than just their products and services. There are all of these global conversations that are happening that are challenging um, our norms, our values, and all of this technology that's powering these conversations, these social media platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, they're all really at the center of this radical change, even in, in the midst of a pandemic. And what we know is that the world, these shifts have had a profound impact on what the expectations are from everyone in the world on what visual expression actually looks like. And so what we're going to talk about is what we need to do about that. What does, how does visual storytelling actually have to evolve? And how can you build an inclusive practice that actually keeps pace with this constantly changing visual landscape? So just a little bit about me and my team before we really dive in. So as I said, I lead the Creative Insights team. And the great thing about our team is we are multidisciplinary and we are global. We all bring experiences from a variety of different professional backgrounds. We're photo editors, we're filmmakers, we come from the nonprofit um, backgrounds, we come from advertising, like myself, I came from the ad agency world. And we sit in locations all around the globe. Um, I personally sit in New York City, but we have colleagues in London, and Tokyo, and very soon to come in Buenos Aires, um, as well as Paris and Sydney. They really, it helps us bring this really global uh, perspective to anticipate the shifts in our collective visual vocabulary. Here again, we look at, um, within this team, we look at billions of searches and hundreds of millions of downloads on our site year over year. We work with the biggest brands of the world in the world, and that gives us access to a treasure trove of data around what our, um, the businesses that we work with are really interested in and engaging with. And we can't do that in a silo, though. We have to put that in context with what's happening out in, in, um, in, in society. So we look at advertising and media trends. We look at what's happening in the news. We look at consumer behavior. We look at film and television and the entire world of creative expression so that we can have an understanding of our evolving visual vocabulary and make sure that everyone that we talk to, whether it's our content creators or the brands that we work with or this wonderful masterclass audience, understands what is going to be new and next. 
The other great thing is that this expertise is actually bolstered by deep, deep data. In addition to our proprietary data that we have um, on, on the side of Getty Images, we were able to amplify that work um, through our, what we call our visual GPS uh, market research. It really combines the proprietary data that we have access to internally, my team's expertise, as well as external consumer research to complete that full cycle of understanding of visual storytelling and visual language. We now know what really consumers are really responding to when it comes to these major, major forces in our world. And that is the data that's actually going to underpin a lot of what I'm going to talk to you here about today. So you understand why we are, um, you know, pushing for the changes that we are asking to see when it comes to visual storytelling. But before we really, really dive in um, to everything that we're going to talk about in terms of building inclusive practice and the importance of visuals, um, inclusive visual storytelling, we want to kind of take a step back um, and talk about the visual landscape. And the first place that we usually start is with what I like to call the crowd effect. So that is really about the democratization of photography that's happened in the last 10, 15 years with the advent of technology and um, the fact that we can now take beautiful, beautiful pictures on our smartphone devices and, you know, and also the fact that social media has allowed all of the traditional um, people to move outside of the traditional gatekeepers of creative expression. The power is, has, uh, more than ever before, the power has been in individuals, regular people, everyday people to tell their stories, to represent themselves how they want to be seen. And what that means is that more voices are at the center than you have ever, ever seen before. And what that's done for our visual landscape is it's actually evolved what we categorize, what we deem um, collectively as authentic and real. Something else that's really important to point to here is the fact that empathy is on the rise. So everyone not wants to know, everyone was asking us, you know, especially as we started lockdown, oh my goodness, I can't <laughs> believe that it's been almost a year here in the U.S. Um, that we've been in lockdown. We've been asked, how is COVID going to change our visual landscape? You know, we're getting these questions, has it made us more empathetic? Has it made us think about our communities and our social structures more? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. And this is being reflected to us back in our data. And we're now seeing searches for terms like trust and gratitude and empathy and that importance of connection, not just in within our communities, even in business. And so we know our customers are incredibly, incredibly interested in how empathy shows up in visuals. And we also know that consumers, we all, we want to be seen. And when it comes to visuals, we want to feel connected to. So this is incredibly, incredibly important to think about and will underpin a lot, a lot of the work that I'm talking about today. The other thing that I would be remiss not to mention is the Black Lives Matter movement and what happened and all of the social rest, unrest that was happening mid last year that kind of continued all the way into late 2020 and even here in the U.S. a little bit um, in, into early 2021. So taking a step back, as I mentioned, we have access to all of our data any t at any given moment in time we can see what, our, um, what people are searching for. And the interesting that thing was that when COVID and lockdown began in March and continued through the spring, particularly in the United States, but actually all around the world, this data is global, we noticed immediately that searches related to diversity and inclusion, including content featuring underrepresented communities, can, uh, appear to take a nosedive. And so it really, really declined so sharply when we saw that there was so much progress in this space um, in years and, and even in the months prior. But then when we think about how um, going into leaving May and entering June and when those Black Lives Matter protests begin to, began to erupt around the world, it was clear that even though this movement has been around uh, since 2014, this was a once in a gen generation tipping point that was upon us, which we believe would have profound impacts on our culture, on our politics, on our social structures, everything. And what also became clear was actually this impact on visual storytelling because you saw from our um, from within our searches this quadruple digit growth in searches for content reflecting the movement, but also related searches around DNI increased. It, it kind of had this uh, correlating effect where it pulled those searches back up um, into the positive. 
Um, and this wasn't pre purely something from for the United States. What was interesting was that this movement, which actually um, it became became global in a way that you hadn't really seen before. You saw protests in Japan, in South Korea, in Denmark, Finland, Sweden, um, the United Kingdom, Portugal, France, Spain, and here specifically in Latin America, Argentina, um, but also Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador, Ev Colombia, everyone was having a conversation about this important movement, even if they didn't have this um, this huge black population, they started to understand that for the black population that does exist in the region, those experiences that are happening in America are also happening um, here in these parts of the world. And so this um, this is a great example of this from a protest we covered in Colombia um, where they were protesting against the murder of five Afro-Colombian teenagers during that time. So. I told you that the, the, this was a correlating had a correlating effect on um, searches around DNI, right? And so what we saw as a consequence of the rise in the Black Lives Matter movement protests, we also saw increased searches around different topics related to diversity and inclusion, whether it's a diverse group of people, whether it's different communities of color, whether it's LGBTQIA identity, equality, different ages, diff um, people with disabilities, people with different gender expressions. We saw that all of these things started to rise back up in a really, really important and significant way as a result of the protests. But what we also saw was that actually in Latin America, unlike in previous years where there was so much very there was so much high interest in DNI from uh, the brands that we work with in the region, the last year when COVID and all of these other things were happening, when those games slowed, um, which we know is happening around the world, they did not pick back up when it came to the the uh the Black Lives Matter protests. They did not grow as significantly as it did in other regions. Well, there are, well, while there were some searches related to diversity and inclusion and different gender identities, it just didn't grow at the same rate. And there were absolutely no searches um, for the Black Lives Matter movement, even though, as I said, the region had several protests in, of their own. And so why does that matter? Why does this kind of um, lack of growth matter? You know, it's because Again, going back to the consumers from that research that we did, um, where we were able to uncover um, that inclusivity and diversity actually remains of the utmost importance to Latin American consumers. What we know is that realness and representation is, is incredibly top of mind and that they, that consumers need brands to demonstrate the commitment, not just, uh, year, not just in moments in, of crisis, but year round on an ongoing basis. And for, furthermore, brands are often falling short of this expectation when it comes to the actual visuals that they're choosing, even outside of this movement. There's a disconnect. They, people just still don't feel represented to, uh, by the imagery that they see in advertising. And so this is incredibly unsettling, right? If you're thinking about the fact that this is so in, incredibly important to the audiences um, in, this, in, in, the, in this part of the world, and yet brands are not keeping pace, why, uh, we need to figure out a way to close that gap. So as I'm, um, you know, one thing that we've been doing to try to help some, um, support brands, especially given the fact that the media and the advertising industry are really still struggling to get it right, is we, we, we understand that we need to use our platform for good and we sit at this really important inflection point for change. So we've done extensive work to figure out, to identify very, very specifically how to make positive visual change that's more attainable for the brands that we work with. We've created a series of different guides. We've also created collections. Um, we've created really targeted information on how creatives, how art directors, how editors, um, how anyone who works in marketing can actually make better visual choices so that they can close that gap. Um, we've already done a few amazing guides to date. We, we did the, um, the guide for our disability collection, which actually accompanies um, our, our disability collection that we created um, in partnership with Verizon, as well as the National, National Disability Leadership Alliance here in the United States, um, but have provides you with guidance around representing people with disabilities around the world. We have women and girls in sport and, the, and kind of highlighting the specific 
specific ways that we can kind of disrupt bias and stereotypes for girls who are women and girls who are participating in sport. We have our See Her guidelines, which actually um, we are launching very, very soon here in Latin America, which is really about recasting how women um, are presented um, in visual narratives. And then most recently we launched in partnership with GLAD, which is again a, an amazing LGBT organization here in the United States. Um, we created a global set of guidelines, however, um, focused on representing the trans community. And we are actually um, in the next couple of months going to be expanding that out to be inclusive of the entire LGBTQIA plus com, um, community, both from the perspective of sexual orientation as well as gender identity and expression. So these are really, really practical tools that we are talking about to kind of create and evoke and inspire this change. Um, and that is what I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser to, especially thinking about this changing visual landscape. So how do we start? Where do we start? And I think that is always kind of the most difficult thing about these conversations that I often have with our brand partners is knowing where exactly where to begin. We know that consumers are so, so interested in inclusion and diversity, but what does that mean in practice? How are brands actually specifically get, getting it wrong and what can we do to get it right? Now today we won't be able to cover everything, although I would love to spend uh, hours and hours and hours on end um, with, with you all. We'll, we'll cover a, a few key areas that we know are incredibly um, important to Latin American consumers. So first thing again, I want to re-emphasize how important the um, more than egg for more than any other region in the world, the Latin American consumer believes that not just in the celebration of diversity, but also in the multitude of ways that it needs to be approached. Um, you know, and we also know that from our work that experiences, the experiences that we go out in the world and have every single day actually drives our culture. It builds our culture up. And the culture that we exist in drives the media. And the media, it drives representation. And so what we, uh, we know that when groups experience bias based on certain aspects of their identity, this very same bias may show up in culture, in media, and in their representation. And so when we do our research, we actually identify that people have said that they've been discriminated based on at least one of these characteristics, whether it's gender, whether it's race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, your lifestyle choices, religion, these are the most common aspects of identity people are discriminated against. Now again, I won't be able to cover every single aspect of identity, but there are some top identities and top reasons why people are discriminated against here in Latin America that I really want to drill down into. Unsurprisingly, uh, the first, the number one is gender. Now, I think when we talk about this work, when I talk about anything around inclusivity and diversity and visual storytelling, I always want to ground us in some really important definitions. And so the first thing to remember about gender is actually that our understanding of gender is very highly socialized. It is not biological. So it's really about these constructed ideas around characteristics, around attitudes, around roles, around the clothing that um, certain uh, that are typically associated with this binary understanding of gender. Whether you're a woman or, or a man, or if you're younger, you're a boy or a girl, as well as the relationship and the dynamics and the dependencies within these two groups. Now different cultures have different ideas about the role of gender in their societies. And so that's also something important to remember. And I, I want to go into that specifically for the Latin American region. We honestly can't begin a conversation about gender, particularly around women, um, without acknowledging the re reality of the lived experiences of women in the region. So, you know, the rallying cry, ni una menos, and um, around Latin America due to the startling statistics of violence of women against women throughout the region. Um, it's, you know, there's so many incredibly real issues. And in fact, during this pandemic, there's been a dramatic surge in cases of violence against women and girls during lockdown. And it's really becoming almost catastrophic. And, you know, Latin America actually already has the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world. And so, um, you know, while we have these lockdown measures that are happening that are vital to stopping the spread of this, um, of this virus, the, what it's also doing, it, doing is heightening the risk of violence in the home um, against women and girls 
cuts them off from education, it cuts them off from the essential protection services, it cuts them off from uh, uh, so their social networks, the communities that can protect them and lift them up. And I point to this specifically because I think these important, these conversations about how women are experiencing certain things are really incredible, instrumental to dismantling certain power structures that may exist um, that keep women down systematically, um, you know, culturally and socially. And what we also know is, as I said, imagery can change the world. And so imagery does play a small, a small, <laughs> does it play a bigger role than the activists and the workers and the, and the boots on the ground that are really creating this change. But it does have, play a small but powerful role in changing perceptions and ideas and attitudes about how people think of women um, and their experiences. And it's not just about women. The other interesting thing is that this balance of this conversation that's happening both with men and um, on the side of men as well. Um, there was this interesting article that I felt like was com coming out um, during the tipping point in the early days of the Me Too movement where conversations were being had about masculinity and the incredibly real consequences faced by um, this perpetuation of um, machismo identity. And so as we're having those conversations globally, we, you started to see that show up in places like Mexico, for example. So this piece is from the New York Times where um, they really explored uh, machista culture in, um, in, in the region um, and it explored the ways in which activists and culture workers were really trying to shift the culture from the perspective of men. Um, they were talking to male participants and like free group therapy. They were speaking with other actors. Um, experts and activists in the space to really understand how we can kind of um, come at this in a different way and kind of disrupt the systems that are perpetuating this violence. The other thing is that um, on the, the right hand side you have this that many nonprofit and uh, academic institutions are continuing to explore this as well especially again thinking about the really the incredibly real consequences during the pandemic where uh, the United Nations were actually be able to draw, uh, they were able to draw some really clear lines between the connection of patriarchal masculinities and violence. And so trying to kind of co um, proactively disrupt that and really um, explore and impact the gender issues in the region. So it's so, these conversations are incredibly important and I think they're feeding how people are, are examining gender and what that means in our social, cultural, political structures. But bringing it back, back to the brands, what we also want to dive into more, most specifically is, uh, the speci uh, uh, is that disconnect and this consumer perception of inclusivity. And what we also have discovered from our research is that the first area that brands tend to struggle with um, when, when it comes to being representative is actually on the front of women. They, uh, um, they struggle to tell their stories. Um, so Dove, uh, the beauty brand Dove, um, did a partnership um, with Edelman Intelligence and actually conducted a survey around women's perceptions of beauties and beauty and stereotypes in media and advertising. And what they actually discovered was that despite all of the conversations and all of the collective efforts across the industry, women still don't feel properly reflected by the brands that actually serve them. And so you also see when you look at this other study from um, a, a, the global brand Deloitte that they did in partnership with the academic experts from anthropology, from advertising, um, to look at actual brand advertising, not just consumer perceptions, that she measured, um, you know, they uh, measured uh, 50 top media spenders across different industries over the course of two years and looked at all of their advertisements. And what they found was that although women are highly visible, they are often um, represented in very stereotypical ways, whether it is the empathetic mom, the boy crazy girl, the devoted wife. There are these reductive stereotypes that are still existing when it comes to women and, um, and, and the advertising that's being shown. Now, how do women actually feel about that? Well, we know also from our work, like I said before, those experiences, how people are living in the world, again, drives how the media is representing them, and it shows up. So what we know is that women actually um, experience discrimination, and they say that the most common reason is that people don't think they are as smart as they are. There are perceptions that women are not as accomplished, not as capable, not as competent, and so 
that is actually showing up for so many women according to our visual GPS research. And more than that, only nearly three in four women that say they, uh, they see per, they most often see portrayals that focus on their appearances, their attractiveness in favor of their accomplishments. You're not really seeing women um, really lead and be in the workplace and be incredibly, incredibly capable and accomplished. You're seeing just a focus on this kind of one dimensional view that's focused on their physical appearance. And so how do we, again, disrupt that? So as I mentioned, we are creating a lot of these guides, these practical guides to identify these questions that we think people should be asking um, when they are uh, uh, to, to be more inclusive when they're choosing visuals. And so for gender across the board, even just thinking about whatever sort of identity or gender expression you are, um, that you are, um, that you have, the first place to start is with stereotyping. So if women feel as though they are typecast, that their appearance is more important than their accomplishments, that, that the nuances of their gender um, are oversimplified, how is this actually playing out in the imagery you're choosing? Are you unconsciously depicting, um, uh, depicting stereotypical representations of women? Those are the questions you need to be asking yourself. When you consider what messages you actually might be conveying by virtue of the roles that you're depicting in your visuals, what are the women doing? What are the men doing? Are there certain roles that are more commonly associated with certain gender identities? You know, who gets to be strong? In this case, this amazing woman pushing a tire, being super, super strong, in charge, dominant. Who gets to have that? Is it only men or are you also showing women in that, in that particular situation? Thinking about more of a business context or in a healthcare setting where you're thinking about the hospital and, and, and doctors and leaders in the space. Who is that person who is leading the meeting? Who is being, being shown as having authority in the room? Who is um, capable, again, competent, accomplished, smart, intelligent? How are those things showing up? Are you showing women in those roles or are you only showing men? Really interrogating those choices that you're making as you choose imagery around representing women. But again, I conversely, you also need to be thinking about how you show men. If we're going to look at well, um, the experiences of women and connect it directly to how men also experience things in the world, we need to start interrogating how we also show um, men in our imagery. When it comes to showing home life, for example, as we all work from home, who's responsible for domestic activities? We actually did a series of image testing this year in our visual GPS study, and what we found was that male respondents were much more interested in imagery that showed them as doting, involved parents. And we know, so we know for certain that care is engendered, and yet care shows up as gendered in the media, in advertising, in a lot of these different in film and television. We need to know, we need to move beyond these kind of really reductive roles. Um, and so when you only, because when you only see certain visuals, it limits your perceptions on what's possible and can actually perpetuate incredibly, incredibly harmful ideas about gender. But going back to what I said before, I told you that we were going to look at this very, very binary view, but I don't believe in the binary. Um, you know, gender is really complex and highly, highly personal. And if you recall, as I said, it is a social construct. It is not, has nothing to do with bio, biology. And so people can express their gender in a multitude of ways, right? And I think so when we round ourselves again in another definition, I think it's important to look at the two lenses that you, we should be thinking about gender through. Now you have your gender identity, and what, which describes how you see yourself, whether you see yourself in alignment with um, you know, the, the sex you were assigned at birth, um, or you don't see yourself, you see yourself as living outside of that binary. And then there's this gender expression, which regardless of your identity, can just describe the, uh, the appearance of how you decide to express your gender through clothing, through hairstyles, and so, and so many other things. And so we have to ask ourselves questions because uh, gender expression is something completely separate uh, than gender identity. And so there's no one way to be um, feminine or masculine. In fact, some individuals may not even want to align themselves with any sort of binary understanding. Um, women who identify as women can also say they want to wear more masculine clothing. 
agender or non-binary people like this person here um, featured in this image. I love them. They are amazing. They can lean into presentation-wise femininity. They can lean into an androgynous look. They can lean into masculinity. It really doesn't matter. Anyone can move fluidly across that spectrum. So if you're only presenting this one-dimensional view of gender and ascribing certain qualities or definitions to fe of femininity or masculinity, then you need to think about your, uh, the fact that you're leaving so much out of the story that needs to be included. Also, it's also about that the, the kind of different expressions of, of gender, regardless, not just one dimensional perspectives. You want to think about how how that shows up, how that uh, you know how that um, how that shows up for people of all ages. So not limiting anyone to um, one kind of box when it comes to gender. I love this picture of this little boy playing in his uh, spaceman suit, but also having a tutu because that's what he wanted to do today. And so making sure that you don't provide this kind of narrow, narrow um, view and you're playing with various, various expressions of gender for any person who exists in this world because that's what we know exists um, uh, out in the real world and that's what we know people are most motivated by. The other thing is not just thinking about gender, that um, uh, gender kind of as um, um, you know, just in clothing, just in appearance, but also about what you are doing. Are you how you have you considered how your imagery might be reinforcing? certain stereotypes about emotions and who gets to express emotion, who gets to be thoughtful, who gets to, um, you know, be emotive, who, uh, who gets to be sad, you know, are those roles and emotions being depicted, um, being depicted equally attributable, attributable to all gender identities and expressions? Or, you know, we need to show that softness that exists in, in men. We need to show that hardness may exist in women because when you show a more expansive view of gender and the possibilities associated with gender, you can bring more people to the center and actually you can change culture. That harmful culture that we were talking about earlier can actually be disrupted in, in very important ways. But this is not just about gender. Um, there's an important concept that has come out of the United States um, in more of an American context, but has broad applications around the world. It's called intersectionality. Now, this is an academic term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 80s when she um, was a law scholar, a legal scholar, um, talking about the compounding effects of black women, um, both the fact that they experienced the world um, discrimination on two fronts, um, on a compounded, on two compounded fronts that cannot be disassociated from race and gender. Now we know that, um, and that can actually have broader implications out, and this is why it's an important concept to remember um, that where you may, we are, none of us are all one thing. We all have multiple identities that, and not all of them are visible. Uh, you know, we all can check a lot of boxes, and, and that is something that creators need to be aware of and accounted for, you know, because intersectionality also highlights where certain groups may be left out or even discriminated against, it's in, despite the fact that we're trying to move towards inclusive visual stories. So you might represent one aspect, one marginalized group, for example, the LGBTQ community, but if you're only showing um, uh, the LGBT uh, male members of the LGBTQIA community, if you're only showing cisgender members of the LGBTQIA community, if you're only showing um, um, the people without disabilities who are part of that community, people who are only white um, that are part of that community, then again, you're leaving out all of those important intersections of identity. And why does that matter? Well, because what we know from our, again, our visual GPS research is that representation is incredibly important and getting it right, it's so critical. And so what, um, people want companies to be inclusive, they want people, uh, companies to reflect real lifestyles, and yet those experiences of discrimination actually drive our understanding of inclusion. And advertising has the immense power to uphold ideas about certain communities and also dismantle them. And so something that's really interesting is that at, in, in Latin America, um, over half of Latin Americans actually experience discrimination based on the color of their skin. There's a there's a habit of a deference to lighter skin and your 
Eurocentric kind of European ideals rather than reflecting the kind of multitude of identities and skin colors and ethnicities that it actually exists in the, in, in the region. And I want to take a moment out here to pause and kind of really um, absorb that with a, with a practical example. Now, I love fashion um, and I love Vogue and I love, um, you know, the work, the work that Vogue has created. One thing I looked at um, because I wanted to see a real tangible example of that sort of uh, preference for Eurocentricity. Now, Vogue in, um, in Espanol actually launched, it wasn't, um, back then wasn't called Latin America and Mexico. It was called as the Vogue in Espanol, and it launched back in 1999. And it became actually one of the premier fashion publications in the regions. It covered 14 countries within Latin America. Now, in the early years, there was so, there were, the number of issues were published throughout the years were actually sporadic. Um, some years it was biannual, some they were quarterly. No matter. <laughs> well, regardless of how often the issues were pub published, what I found from research was that there was a consistent thread where there was a lack of Latin models gracing those first 15 years of covers in a, um, in a magazine that was aimed at actually reflecting the region. And even though what we know about the region, there are huge indigenous populations all in countries all throughout Latin America. There are also huge black populations in countries all through Latin America, particularly in Brazil, in Colombia, in Peru, in um, Mexico, yet you don't see that anywhere here. Um, we looked at the fact that most of those models um, from all of those covers over the course of those years were not um, um, they were not uh, Latina. They were actually either um, European or they were American. There were some Brazilian models and there were some um, models from Spain, but most of those covers were not featuring real um, Latinas from the region. And from 20, 2007 to two, 2013, not a single Latin American model appeared on the cover. And, and you know, well, there are a variety of reasons that that, that could have been. We maybe have sh saw a shift in advertisement um, around the world from what was perceived as risky because of a, a global recession and all of those things. But really and truly, there were so few um, representation of actual Latin, Latin models, and they were all, everyone was all very, very light and light skinned, or they may have had their hair or their feature darkened to kind of look Latina. And so that. Fashion, again, representation that drives culture, that drives experiences. And so if you're not seeing yourself in media and important mag um, magazines and institutions um, like this one, you are not feeling heard and seen and you may experience discrimination in your real life. But then you see this amazing shift that can start to happen. And I'm so proud of the Vogue team, um, you know, that um, that came in, Carla Martinez, who came in and kind of took over, took the reins. And what you saw was that kernels of a shift in 2014. And, you know, you have models like Isa Lish, who, um, a model from Mexico City, who's, who's mixed of Japanese and Mexican descent. But you also have Joan Smalls, uh, you know, um, who's black and, poor, and from Puerto Rico. You have um, Isa Brito, who's from the Dominican Republic. And so you start to see these Afro-Latina models that are being part, um, being included at the center and being celebrated and lifted up in these really, really beautiful ways. And that kind of, in favor of more of that, um, you know, more European looking women, which was really positive and powerful. Um, and you, that continued over the course of the next several years from, you know, 2017, 2018 through 2020. And that, that habit and continued. And you see much more diversity um, than you did in previous years. And more than that, it's obviously something that's continuing even in the midst of a pandemic. You have the um, Mexican icon, Thalia. You have, um, you, um, and you have blessing, uh, blessing, Bless Naya <laughs> Minera, I should practice that one. Um, she isn't Latina, but she is a model of African descent from the country of Angola, Angola. And I think it's incredibly significant for her, again, to be the cover star uh, this past February because of the fact that when they, there's a difference, even when they're not showing Latina models to more European or American models. And so this is an important and positive change. And we want to see more of that change because of going back to this idea um, um, that w that the uh, the fact that many Latin Americans are experiencing discrimination based on their skin color, if the media starts making those changes, then we know that those experiences may shift as well. 
But it's not just about skin color and ethnicity. Um, it's all from our visual GPS research. We also know that actually discrimination based on body shape, based on size, is actually top of mind for um, consumers. In fact. In Latin America, this is one of the um, high, uh, highest re regions in the world with the highest ex rates of experience of discrimination based on your bodies. And so, so many people, um, looking back to some uh, some of the models that are included, often you see them being very, um, the cover stars, they're very thin, uh, they're very tall, you're not really seeing real bodies, real shapes, real, t um, real types, you're not seeing rolls and lumps and bumps and curves in the same way, and those experiences show up in really negative ways um, um, for, uh, Latin, uh, for our Latin American consumers. In fact, um, you know, it's also, uh, um, women are more likely to actually experience uh, body discrimination in the region because they're seen as too heavy, uh, too curvy, and men, it's not just about uh, women, men are actually experienced to, likely to experience um, uh, body discrimination based on the fact that they may be too skinny too weak or, uh, or you know, not tall enough. And so obviously body, body positivity and that inclusion and that centering needs to be something that's top of mind for brands in the region. And the reason why was the actually going back to that example of um, uh, visual testing, right, that I shared about gender, uh, care not being gendered at all. What we also know is that women are actually more responsive to um, imagery featuring uh, bo women of, with real bodies, all shapes and sizes and lumps and bumps and all, all marks, all, uh, <laughs> all sorts of things that really exist on women's bodies. They're more responsive to, responsive to visuals that show that than they are to visuals that don't. And so they want to see those real bodies having fun, living their life, out with their friends, being joyful, not being sad, you know, really living the lives in a positive, positive way. And again, thinking back to the fact that people are experiencing discrimination based on their body type, you know, it's really important to start showing imagery that actually actively disrupts some of those perceptions that people may have. So again, I want to ask you some questions to get your mind going and get you thinking about the ways that these things can play out visually and the ways that you can actively do your part to disrupt that. Um, you know, thinking about not just but going back to skin color, um, thinking about ethnicity, but also thinking about bodies, right? There's a fine line between tokenization and storytelling with death. Uh, with any sort of death. Now tokenization, um, just a really quick explanatory comma, tokenism is really about making only a symbolic gesture to show um, a person with a marginalized or um, underrepresented identity in your imagery. Um, so you're not really giving them the same depth of storytelling. You're not including them um, in the center or the primary role within the image. You may be, have them as a background color. So think, while I love the United Colors of Benetton, um, though all of those ads where they had people of different races and ethnicities, that was great. But if you're not really giving full storytelling to, um, you know, the people who, um, who may have identified as LGBTQ, the people who were um, the black people People, the Asian people, um, you know, the Latino people that were included, um, but were not at the center, you're kind of not giving them the opportunity, the same opportunity as maybe those dominant groups to get that depth, the storytelling. And so you should be asking yourself, how fully realized are the stories of the people of color, but also anyone with marginalized identities, the, the, um, how, how fully realized are those stories? Um, in the visuals that you are choosing, in the campaigns that you're concepting, um, when you're making your choices. And like I said, are you preferring, um, you know, if those discrimination, if these experiences of discrimination are the realities for people of color, for example, what are the ways that marketers and creative leaders can actually actively disrupt perceptions? Are you going to do the, you know, like Vogue was doing and making some really positive progressive change? So if, you, if, the, if the culture collectively has a habit of prioritizing lighter skin, how can we interrogate our practices so we're not deferring to one skin tone? Maybe showing darker skin tones, maybe showing um, more black Latino people or showing more indigenous Latino people who may have darker skin or different hair types or textures. Really showing the kind of multitude of the diversity that exists within this amazing region. 
But again, moving beyond skin type um, and skin color, also thinking about representing people who with larger bodies and ensuring that people with larger bodies are included without exception or objectification. So not allowing them to feel free, to not be retouched. Like I said, when we talked about the crowd effect, people want things that are real. They don't want things that are super highly polished. They don't want you blurring out the marks, the lumps and bumps and all of that. People want to see the real. And so showing people with larger bodies is a part of that story. But also thinking about that fine line of between tokenization and humanizing because plus size bodies are uh, often visually excluded from the most everyday um, uh, regular narratives. They don't get included in stories about bustling work life. They don't get included in stories about loving relationships or familiar stories or, you know, being shown as leaders in the workplace. They're, they actually only often get shown when it comes to their physical health, when it comes to fitness activities, when it comes to actually losing weight. And that is not, again, that is tokenistic, that is very reductive, and it becomes a stereotype. So you have to ask yourself, who gets to, how are you representing um, people with larger bodies? Do they get to experience love? Do they get to lead? Do they get that sort of tenderness? And again, like I said, people, um, you know, thinking about that story of larger bodies is not just about women, it is about men as well. And so being, um, and, and people who identify both within and outside of that binary, so being incredibly inclusive and intersectional and layered in your approach is going to be incredibly important. And um, I definitely plan this out because it's a nice segue into a reminder to represent visual, um, individuals alongside the various intersections of identity that can exist. So if you're thinking about the fact that you want to represent someone who might have a darker skin tone, who might be Afro-Latino, or might be um, from the indigenous community, how are you representing along their, um, along their other intersections of identity? Are you showing um, different gender identities and expressions? Are you showing different ages? Um, are you showing different um, the, um, disabilities? Are you showing different sexual orientations? Or are you only deferring to the one marginalized aspect of their identity to the exclusion of others? You really, really have to interrogate those practices so that you can actively, again, make better choices that tell the stories that people are looking for to see um, from the media. Uh, the last uh, area that I want to cover with you today, and again, I'm, you know, I could talk about this forever and ever and ever, um, but I, you know, I would just want to hit on some really key important points, particularly in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, 85 million people in Latin America actually, and the Caribbean, um, live with a disability. 85 million. That is a massive population, and yet, uh, advertisements, less than 1% of images are actually shown, um, uh, 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 they are shown in less than 1% of images that in our popular content. And also this is almost exactly in line with that same Deloitte study that I mentioned from earlier, that less than 1% of studied advertisement also um, they uh, featured a person with disability. And so they are incredibly invisible from the media. And they are often not included in very positive ways. Although there's been some progress, it's not coming quickly enough. So the questions you have to start asking yourself is how are you showing that up? Because we're actually starting from scratch. And so as you are building out your practice to actually start including people with disabilities, you have to ask yourself about what are the type of messages, what are the type of scenarios, the type of concepts that you're actually conveying about people with disabilities. Are you showing something that's positive? Are you only focusing on the person's disability? Are you showing the whole range of life experiences and relationships that a person with disabilities may have? Are you showing them lounging on the couch, listening to music, having a good time? Are you showing them at work? Are you showing them, um, you know, with their friends, within their communities, amongst their loved ones? You really have to ask yourself how, the, how these representations are actually showing up in the world. Furthermore, Speaking of that, um, you, are you showing people with disabilities of having active and fulfilling and really positive, um, loving lives? 
Are you only showing people with disabilities in wheelchairs? Are you, but um, are you expanding that definition to people with cognitive or invisible disabilities? I was asked um, once about uh, showing people, um, telling stories about people with autism. Um, and one thing that the person asked me in the conversation I was having was, well, how will I know how do I show a person with autism while still being authentic, but also showing that they have autism? And I ask, why do you need to show that they have autism? Who is that for? Is that for the person with autism? Or is that for the person who doesn't have autism? You really have to think about the stories that you're telling, because we don't give a second thought to all of the experiences of people who don't have a disability, right? We don't give a second thought to showing, well, needing to show well, if I like race cars, I need to have a race car in my hand while I'm in a, in a visual. Like, that's not necessarily the case. People contain multitudes. And the important point um, and something we've been trying to do quite a bit more of is actually casting real people with the real, um, with the, uh, that are having those real lived experiences. And so it, within our disability collection, for example, that is a big thing that we push for, which is actually not, if a person doesn't have a disability, if they are not in a wheelchair, for example, if they don't have a mobility disability, or they're not uh, blind or they are not deaf or you know or hard of hearing then you should not be casting them or presenting them in those scenarios and I think that is something that also people um, in this space need to practice and so showing um, the, the really positive true authentic experiences of people with disabilities because we know they exist um, as they as they live out in the world so what we you know all of this to say, and something that import, is really important to uh, remember through all of the work that I kind of presented here today, is that the results show for us, thinking uh, that imagery doesn't really need to look like us to actually, in order to resonate, people are incredibly, incredibly responsive to the, um, capturing things that just feel real, with real people who are interesting, who are warm. Um, we are motivated and empathetic, and we actually are more thoughtful than the media often gives us credit for. You know, we don't, we are not interested from, we know that from our research, people are not always interested in seeing people that look like all of us. But what we are interested in is real authentic stories that are inclusive, that are relatable and uh, and in turn aspirational. Realism is actually the new sort of aspirational. So it's important for brands to remember that as they're approaching, um, I think, this work. And there's, it's not just kind of the right thing to do. Um, we also know that this actually impacts the body bottom line. So in that same study I've kind of uh, quoted throughout this presentation um, by Deloitte, they also looked at the stock growth for each of the brands that over that, those two years, that two year period that they studied them, as well as their sort of brand index scores to kind of get a sense of how all of their corresponding, uh, corresponding ads actually impacted public perception. And, and, and ultimately ultimately the bottom line. And it turns out that the brands who were with the ads that were most represented um, scored the highest and actually averaged a 44% stock increase over that course of the two year and were more 83% more likely to see um, in a boost in a positive boost in their brand index scores. And so that makes a difference to the bottom line 1000 percent And also consumers see it. I mean I've talked Oh, repeatedly, repeatedly about all of the ways that this is important to consumers. But if I uh, leave you with nothing um, that I want to at least provide some hard hitting data and that, you know, there was a study done by Female Quotient. Um, they partnered with Google and Ipsos um, a couple of summers ago to survey consumers from various backgrounds. And what they found was that when ads were more, most representative and most inclusive, that consumers were more likely to take action, a positive action, um, um, compared to um, ads that were not uh, inclusive or representative. So it matters. This is work that matters, that impacts the bottom line. So I hope as we think about this work, remembering to kind of make these positive changes um, can really kind of make a difference, not just for the world, but also for um, the businesses that we work in. So finally, shameless, shameless, shameless plug. <laughs> 
we talk about this. I love chatting about this. I talk about this everywhere that I can. Um, so what I highly recommend is that you please visit creativeinsights.gettingimages.com backslash ES. You can see all of our trends, our insights, even spotlight on new content that's coming in that we think is fresh and interesting and compelling. We talk about all of this work. We also talk about our efforts to repicture, reimagine certain communities on a regular basis. Um, you can get more in-depth um, always on insights from our creative, from my team um, here in the Americas, but also around the world on a regular basis at creativeinsights.gettyimages.com. So with that, I would like to thank you so much uh, for spending time with me. Many, many, many thanks to the Masterclass uh, team for having me today. I'm so excited to have been able to spend this time and share all of our wonderful findings with you all. Thank you very much, Tristan, and congratulations. Verdaderamente, una masterclass radical como el objeto mismo de su estudio, como la incorporación urgente de nuevas narrativas visuales al mundo de las marcas, al, a, todos, a todos los mundos posibles, incluso de nuestras propias vidas, en todas nuestras interacciones. We see you soon in November, Tristan, in Buenos Aires. Please. I cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hay empresas que desde hace muchos años vienen no solo marcando el camino de la inclusión y del fortalecimiento respecto de la población LGBTIQ+, en el mundo del trabajo, mientras van marcando ese camino, lo van sellando lo van pavimentando, van haciendo eso mismo y mucho más. Es por esto que el próximo reconocimiento que la Cámara de Comercio LGBT de la Argentina quiere hacer en esta Masterclass es a esta empresa. Ansiedade, incerteza, isolamento. Pero estamos juntos en esto. Então vamos nos ajudar. Colabore um com o outro e seja empático. Você não está só. You are not alone. Não está só. Você não está só. Today, more than ever, we rely on diversity to navigate this scenario. Hoje, mais do que nunca, precisamos cuidar um do outro. Nós somos colegas. Somos amigos. Somos familia. We are one SAP. Nós somos one SAP. Somos um SAP. Vamos resolver isso juntos e vamos nos encontrar novamente. Mantente comprometido. Mantenha-se saudável. Mantenha-se seguro. Strong together. Stronger together. Stronger together. Stronger together. Stronger together. Así es, SAP, el reconocimiento va para todos ustedes y es por eso que quiero darle la bienvenida para que reciba, por lo menos de esta manera, en estos términos, este reconocimiento a quien representa, en este caso, a SAP, que es Ezequiel Massa. Hola, Ezequiel. Qué honor, Franco. Eh, muchas gracias a todo el equipo por este reconocimiento y por la organización de este evento impecable. Mi nombre es Ezequiel Massa, trabajo como líder de diversidad e inclusión para SAP Latinoamérica y Caribe. 
Y les cuento que este video que acabamos de ver lo grabamos hace unos meses con representantes de toda la región. Colombia, Chile, Perú, México, Argentina, Brasil, incluso Miami. Y si bien la pandemia no nos permitió reencontrarnos en persona todavía, el compromiso sigue firme. Nuestra misión es hacer del mundo un lugar mejor y mejorar la vida de las personas. Puede sonar utópico, lo sé, pero creo que vamos por un buen camino. Siempre digo que en ese AP la diversidad se respira en el aire, la inclusión es parte de nuestro ADN. Yo realmente lo, lo siento, lo vivo así. Nuestra estrategia nos invita a posicionar a las personas que integran la compañía en el centro, en el eje de todo lo que hacemos. Y a su alrededor construimos una cultura inclusiva, un plan de carrera inclusivo y un ecosistema diverso. Todo suena muy bien, pero ¿cómo lo llevamos a la práctica? Hay algunos ejemplos que puedo mencionar. Lanzamos un protocolo regional para casos de violencia de género. Hicimos una campaña regional también de capacitaciones acerca de machismo, sexismo y nuevas masculinidades. Definimos metas operativas en cuanto a mujeres en plantilla y en posiciones de liderazgo. También para personas afrodescendientes en Brasil. Contratamos a más de 40 personas con autismo en toda la región desde el lanzamiento del programa Autismo en el Trabajo en 2016. Brindamos distintos ciclos de capacitaciones para personas trans en situación de vulnerabilidad. Organizamos programas de mentoreo para emprendedores sociales. Actualizamos las licencias parentales para que sean más inclusivas para todas las personas, independientemente de género o orientación sexual. Adecuamos nuestros eventos internos y externos para que sean más accesibles. Ofrecemos programas de liderazgo para mujeres y otros grupos subrepresentados. Estamos lanzando ahora una campaña para destinar un porcentaje de nuestros gastos a emprendedores sociales y proveedores diversos. Y seguramente se me escapan algunas iniciativas. Y así todo, hay mucha tela para cortar, hay un largo camino por delante para recorrer. Gracias de nuevo por este reconocimiento. Gracias a todo el equipo de SAP, a nuestras, nuestros grupos de afinidad que tienen un, un papel clave en, en hacer todo esto posible, a nuestros aliados y sponsors. Y vamos por más. Sigamos colaborando y aprendiendo y avanzando hacia una sociedad más justa, con igualdad de oportunidades para todas, todes y todos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias Ezequiel y bueno, por cierto, de vuelta muchas felicitaciones a todo de SAP, también digo todo de SAP, cómo no. Acaban de pasar nada más que las dos primeras charlas, las dos primeras masterclasses, queda la tercera, queda la cuarta, vale decir que este evento recién empieza, les propongo hacer una especie de pausa, tomarnos a algún tiempo y a eso de las 3 pm más o menos hora de Buenos Aires, no olviden que estamos transmitiendo por streaming desde la ciudad de Buenos Aires esta Masterclass G Network 360, nos volvemos a encontrar. Muchísimas gracias a todos, la estamos pasando, creo yo, fabuloso.